Um, yes, yeah, so as Helen said, we are here today at the International Marxist University to discuss history. However, when I was 16, I decided that I would never study history again. To be honest, I found it quite boring. And that's because in the schools, in the universities, it is presented as just one fact after another. There is no rhyme or reason to anything. It's just a bland succession of events. And when causes are given, they are very superficial. Now, to illustrate this, I found a British school textbook expl explanation as to why World War I started. Uh, and they give a list of, of four causes of this war. Number one. Kaiser Wilhelm personally wanted an empire. Number two, alliances caused tensions and mistrust between countries. However, there's no clue as to why these particular alliances were made at this particular time. Number three, the naval race created a conflict between Britain and Germany. Again, though, you were left wondering why at this particular time there was a naval race. Then the final cause that is given is the murder of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Uh, in a certain sense, this did cause the war, as it acted as an initial spark. But if the Archduke had had the flu that morning and hadn't gone out on his drive, and so avoided assassination, there would still have been a war. You can't explain major historical events by small details like this. There are plenty of political assassinations and not all of them cause world wars. So what you can see is that history tends to be taught as being the result of either the wishes of great men or due to superficial accidents. Now, I did begin studying history again, but this was because I was inspired by a correct method of approaching it. And that's the Marxist method of dialectical materialism, the philosophy of Marxism. Uh, and historical materialism is essentially the application of this method to the study of history. So history is not viewed as a series of isolated facts. Instead, it encourages you to discover the general processes and laws that govern nature and society. Now, it is funny that so-called historians deny that there are laws that operate in human history. I don't think that these people would deny the fact that there are laws that operate in nature. But for some reason, humanity, according to them, is completely different and no general laws apply. Well, Marxism does accept that there are general laws operating in society and that these can be studied and understood. Now, there is another claim uh, that the historian should be neutral in order to present history in a truthful manner. And so according to these people, because Marxists are incredibly biased, then they are unable to reflect historical events accurately. Now, we have to point out, first of all, that there are no neutral historians. Any writing of history represents a class point of view. You need to decide, are you on the side of the oppressed and the exploited, or do you take the side of the status quo, of the defending the ruling class? Uh, and you can clearly see what side this impartial school textbook I mentioned was on, so-called impartial, because um, they, you know, not only was everything, according to them, the fault of the evil German Kaiser, but their description of the British Empire is truly shameless. They say, while people around the world had different experiences of the empire, it brought the UK huge amounts of wealth and power. So all of the hundreds of millions of people who experienced the massacres, concentration camps and enslavement that the British Empire brought, well, they just had a, a different experience to the British ruling class who enjoyed all the proceeds, of course. Now, of course, this is not exactly a neutral, impartial view of the British Empire. Now, Marxists do take a stance in history, and we're honest about it. We take a stance on the side of the oppressed and exploited, but that does not in the least make us unable to get to the truth. In fact, it makes us more able to do so. Partiality does not mean uh, that you're less interested in finding the truth. Is a doctor, for example, uh, uninterested in effectively diagnosing their patient because they have an interest in doing so? No, I think it's precisely because a doctor does wish to treat the patient effectively, that they work hard to find the causes for the symptoms a patient is experiencing. And much the same with the Marxists, because we have a huge interest in learning from history to avoid making the same mistakes as the past, we have to present a truthful account. 
And this compa compares extremely favorably to bourgeois history. Uh, the British school curriculum has no interest whatsoever in uncovering the brutal crimes of the British state. And so, whenever possible, they will look to prettify it. Now, if the schools and universities don't present uh, an impartial and truthful account of history, you certainly can't expect them to present a truthful account of Marxism. Consistently, straw men are created in order to attack and discredit Marxist ideas. One of these is that uh, Marxists reduce everything to economics. It is said that Marx believed that changes in the economic base automatically produce changes in the so-called superstructure. The superstructure is made up of the ideas, institutions, political parties, things like this, which form on top of the economic base. Uh, another similar claim is that Marxists think capitalism will automatically collapse and be replaced by a communist society. However, Marxism does not view history as an automatic process. Marx said, history does nothing. It possesses no immense wealth and wages no battles. Instead, it is real living man who does all that. And he continues, he says, history is nothing but the activity of man pursuing his aims. However, these individuals pursue their aims as part of a particular society and are subject to certain laws. And so that means that their aims and ideas don't just pop out of nowhere. World War I didn't happen just because the Kaiser fancied it. And in actual fact, explaining history as a product of the aims of individuals doesn't really make any sense when you think about it. People may believe they are acting in a certain way and for certain reasons, but what they intend rarely actually happens as they planned it. We can look at the French Revolution. Here, the leaders fought under the banner of liberty, equality and fraternity. They believed they were fighting for a society based on justice and reason. But regardless of their intentions, they were actually preparing the way for the rule of the bourgeoisie in France. In fact, Marx actually... Uh, said this subjective approach to history is like trying to get a good picture of someone's character by asking them what they think of themselves. Instead, using a materialist approach, Marx says, life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness by life. But what does this mean? Well, before human beings can develop art or philosophy or science, they first of all need to um, satisfy their basic needs of um, food and shelter. But in order to produce these things, uh, Marx says that um, humans need to enter into certain relations with others. Uh, and these relations don't just purely depend on our own subjective will. It depends ultimately on the stage of development of the material productive forces. But what are productive forces? Well, in producing things that they need to, humans innovate and they create in order to make themselves more efficient and make their lives easier. Uh, and this includes everything from the introduction of the hand axe 1.7 million years ago to the introduction of large scale production in factories with the Industrial Revolution. And what Marx says is that the way we produce our means of subsistence ultimately influences the relations between producers. And he says that the, the sum total of, the, of all of these relations, that is what constitutes this economic structure of society. And it's on this foundation that this so-called superstructure is formed. We can take the state as an example. It's uh, formed ultimately due to the existence of separate classes in society. There's basically the need for a power that to some extent stands above uh, society, but equally it is still born out of that society itself and ultimately exists in order to keep the conflict of the classes within a certain order, with that order, of course, being in the interests of the ruling class at the time. Now, the state can take on many different forms, even within one mode of production. Under capitalism, for example, we've had everything from uh, the welfare states that formed in many countries, right up to Bonapartist dictatorships, i.e. Uh, police states or you know, military dictatorships, basically. These are states that are able to rise above uh, the class struggle to a much greater degree. Uh, and we can take uh, Chile under Pinochet as an example of this. Now, uh, this, this character um, murdered um, and uh, attacked huge numbers of workers. But under his rule, the capitalists also had uh, many freedoms taken off them. Now, these two uh, different examples of states 
had huge differences between them, obviously. But we can characterize them as being capitalist states because ultimately they were based on and defended the private ownership of the means of production. In Chile, the class struggle had reached such a pitch uh, and there was no class able to offer a way forward. And so this allowed the state to gain this uh, certain amount of independence. Whereas in the examples of the welfare states, the social democratic leaders were able to mollify the working class and so maintain the ultimate rule of the capitalist class. Now, this relationship between the economic base and the superstructure is not a, a mechanical relationship with a one way and automatic influence from the base to the superstructure. It's a, it, instead, it's, it's a dialectical relationship where the base and the superstructure interact back uh, on each other. So superstructural elements, once formed, can interact uh, and act back on the economic base. Now, if you think about it, if uh, Marxists denied this possibility, then we would all be wasting our time sat here, really. We believe a revolutionary party is necessary to lead the working class to victory and overthrowing capitalism and changing the mode of production. Uh, and what else is this but an example of a superstructural element uh, influencing the economic base? Now, of course, this can't be done in uh, any situation and it doesn't just depend on our uh, subjective will, but I'll come back to this. So Marx says that humans pursue their own aims, but not in conditions of their own choosing. But what does this mean? Well, first of all, your outlook, your sensibilities, even your morality is shaped to a very large degree by the mode of production that you live under. Before the existence of private property, for example, the idea of theft would be nonsensical. There'd be no need really to have this uh, social pressure against stealing things if uh, things were largely held in common. Now, on top of this, your outlook is also shaped to a very large extent by your social class. Um, <clears throat> if you're a capitalist, it makes moral sense for you to push down the wages and conditions of your workers. If you're a worker, on the other hand, it makes moral sense for you to push up your wages and uh, fight for better conditions. So what is moral in both instances depends on your social class. And obviously we do not choose what epoch we are born into or what class we are born into. Now, whilst there's no automatic relationship between the economic base and the superstructure, Marxists say that ultimately economic necessity asserts itself. Marxists say that the viability of any system depends on the ability to develop the productive forces. To put it simply, is there a general tendency towards producing more for less? Now, if we look at the whole of human history, we can see that there has been a general chain of development from lower to higher forms of society. And this hasn't taken place in a kind of slow and steady, constant upward march. It's taken place in a dialectical manner. Again, what does this mean? Well, Trotsky said that dialectics is the logic of evolution. And if we look at the evolution of species, we can see that there are long periods of no change whatsoever, which are interrupted by sudden leaps of development. And on top of this, there can be periods of regression or stagnation as well. And there is uh, there are similarities here to the evolution of human society. Uh, there are long periods of very little change, which are interrupted by these sudden leaps between different stages in society. And this is what we would call a revolution. So whilst regression and stagnation uh, is not ruled out by Marxists, we would say that the general line of, uh, of human development has been in a progressive direction. And that would even include the emergence of class society can take uh, as an example the emergence of uh, slavery as the mode of production in Greece and Rome. Now, from a Marxist point of view, this was progressive in that it freed up a section of society from the need to carry out manual labour, because this freed up a, a privileged section of society to, you know, have the time to produce amazing developments. So despite the brutal nature uh, of, uh, of these regimes, Really, we still owe a, a huge deal of our civilization to, to Rome and Greece. But like all social systems, at a certain stage, this system reached its limits. So from being something that drove humanity forward, it actually became a drag on human progress and entered into a lengthy period of decline. And what Marxists do say is that when society shows no way forward, we enter into a period of revolution and counter-revolution. 
And you saw that in Rome, you had the, the um, slave uprisings under the leadership of Spartacus. <clears throat> Here, the slaves rose up and defeated the um, armies of this powerful empire again and again. However, ultimately, this movement failed, it was defeated. What we had here was a situation where the relations of production, the slave economy, had come into conflict with the further development of the productive forces. However, it didn't mean an automatic collapse of the system and its replacement with the next stage, uh, feudalism, because what was required was real living human beings to show the way forward. And because this didn't happen, there was deadlock and decline for about 400 years. And eventually the whole system collapsed in on itself as the barbarians ended up defeating Rome. And despite what these uh, textbooks say, Marx did account for this because he said that the, uh, the class struggle can end either in a revolutionary con reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. So we can see here that Marxists don't discount the notion that human progress can stagnate or be thrown backwards. Now, there's a fashionable idea in academia to say that there's no such thing as progress. Uh, and some honest students can perhaps get uh, taken in by this. And if you consider how the idea of progress was used to justify imperialism, for example, then we can say, you know, a certain rejection of this notion is, is, shows, is a bit healthy. However, we, we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What I'd say is, who really can deny um, that the productive capability of humanity as a whole has progressed somewhat over time. Because for most of human history, it was a real struggle just to produce enough food to survive. But now we produce enough food to feed 10 billion people. Now, of course, this, uh, this progress does not mean that we think that uh, uh, the lives of all human beings have been improved equally. By progressive, what we mean is that these stages of society are laying the basis for a socialist society, which would be one free of all oppression and exploitation. Now, when a social system goes into crisis, you can react in one of two ways. You can decide to fight for something better, which I hope is the majority opinion here, or in, in total misery, you can retreat in on yourself and basically give up. Now, this uh, latter outcome is why you tend to see the proliferation of mystical or irrational or subjective tendencies at times of crisis. So in this long period of decline of the Roman Empire, you had the spreading of a whole host of religious sects. And Roman philosophy at that time was dominated by subjectivist ideologies, i.e. philosophies that uh, reject or doubt the existence of the external material world. Now, one law of historical materialism is that similar conditions produce similar outcomes. And we have a similar situation today because the ruling class today can see no way forward under their own system. And it's for that reason that their ideologists promote the idea that there is actually no such thing as progress after all. It's for the same reason that philosophies that make us doubt or question the existence of an objective reality are also promoted. This really is the ultimate reason for postmodernism. It's a reflection of the dead end of the capitalist system. Now, we speak about specific stages of human development, uh, from primitive communism, slave society, feudalism, capitalism. Now, these stages are abstractions from reality. Every particular slave or feudal or capitalist society is different from the other, but that doesn't mean that these categories are useless. Any abstraction ignores what is particular to that individual example of a thing and looks at what unites them. So you might be sitting on a chair, it might be black, it might be brown, it might have four legs, it might have three, it might have wheels, it might not. But that doesn't mean that you reject the category of chair in general, because no individual chair may look like this uh, perfect conception in your mind. Because actually abstraction is incredibly useful for humanity and categorizing things. So when we say that uh, the economy is a slave society, it doesn't mean that 100% of the population is either a slave or a master. What we are saying is that the dominant form of production in that society is slavery. And of course, reality is far more complicated than abstractions. You still have the existence of slavery in capitalist or feudal societies. 
and you had, you had elements of capitalism in feudal or even slave societies. But there's also the opposite problem. So whilst we mustn't reject abstractions in general, we also must not uh, use them in a mechanical way. Because if you maintain a, a formalistic way of looking at things, you'll be unable to understand change because there isn't a clear dividing line between, say, feudalism and capitalism. In actual fact, that is precisely how change takes place. Because within the old society, you have a new one struggling to be born. What we see is that changes between social systems don't really take place from uh, due to external pressures, but from changes within the social system itself. Under feudalism, you had the towns, industry, and the development uh, of the working class and the bourgeoisie. Uh, and all of these were born within the old feudal society. And as the bourgeoisie became more and more powerful and wage labor uh, more and more the dominant form of production, these new relations of production rebelled against the chains of feudalism. And eventually this contradiction had to be broken through a revolution. And it's much the same today. We can see the embryo of a socialist system being born within capitalism. Whilst capitalism used to be progressive, it has turned into its opposite. Free competition has given, away, uh, given way to monopoly. You have uh, now huge multinational corporations that cover the entire planet. And uh, <clears throat> Alan went into this earlier, but what you see actually is that internally, these companies plan to a, an extremely high degree. And so what you have is that in, in normal times, uh, Tesco's or, or Walmart or any of these sorts of companies, they are able to plan exactly how much food will be needed in each community. They coordinate with farmers, they transport it to central warehouses, uh, and they distribute it to different communities. It's an operation that very rarely goes wrong. Now, of course, I'm sure we've, uh, we've all noticed that this planning uh, has gone wrong in a rather spectacular way uh, of late. But the reason for this, ultimately, is that whilst there's uh, elements of planning within capitalist companies, this isn't the case across uh, society, across the globe as a whole. But the main point here is that capitalism, by concentrating production into these massive companies, this is actually laying the basis for socialism. Because rather than uh, nationalizing countless tiny little shops that aren't coordinated, what would be needed instead is only to nationalize the largest companies and put them under the democratic control of the working class. Now, earlier, I, uh, I ridiculed this school textbook for reducing the entire uh, role of starting World War I to the German Kaiser. But that's not to say that individuals play no role at all. Marxists deny that an individual, purely from the force of their personality, with nothing else required, can shape history as they please. However, when conditions are right, an individual can play an important, if not a crucial, role. After all, Leon Trotsky said that without Lenin, the Russian Revolution would have failed. And that's because on the verge of the revolution, it required Lenin to fight against most of the Bolshevik leadership to win the party round to the idea of taking power. And without Lenin's struggle, it's likely that the Bolsheviks would have prevaricated. And inst instead of the successful Russian revolution, you would have had Russian fascism. So we can see that the individual role of Lenin was vital at that time. But Lenin had been a revolutionary and a Marxist for a long time before 1917. And so, therefore, the, the right conditions were needed in order for this great individual to be able to play this role. And it is common for, uh, for great revolutionary leaders often only to come to the fore in times of the heat of revolution. As well as Lenin, you have uh, Cromwell, Robespierre, Lincoln... On the other hand, uh, in, in a time of uh, downswing of the revolutionary movement, you have the rise of mediocrities, people like Stalin, um, and we can use the USSR as an example. So Lenin and Trotsky hoped that the revolution would be a spark that set off revolutions across Europe. Uh, and this did happen, but unfortunately these revolutions failed, and so Russia was ultimately isolated. And with this isolation, with this continued poverty, backwardness, and the invasion of 21 of the most powerful countries in the world, eventually you had apathy set in amongst the mass of the working class and peasantry. 
I mean, how really were you supposed to introduce workers' democracy when the mass of the population was starving or, you know, illiterate? And it was this apathy that allowed a bureaucracy to rise to the top, um, and they chose an individual to represent their interests. And actually, Stalin's individual personality matched this situation, and that's really why he was able to rise to the top. So, as opposed to the idealist approach to history, which explains everything as a product of great men, Marxism explains that great individuals are only great because of the social forces that they represent. And if these forces don't exist, they are unable to be great. Uh, Trotsky once said, the office of kingship doesn't lodge within the king himself. It is an interrelation between people. The king is only king because the interests and prejudices of millions are refracted through his person. When the flood of development sweeps away these interrelations, the king appears a washed out man with a flabby lower lip. So individuals can play a decisive role in history, but only in the right conditions. Now, We've said that there are laws that operate in history just as in, uh, as in nature, but these laws are not exact. The history of human society is a far more complex system than that of a simple chemical reaction. Additionally, we're not exactly able to carry out experiments as revolutionaries. So what we have to do instead is uh, to study history in order to gain general lessons from it. But there's a problem here, because each revolution has its own specific characteristics. The revolutions in England, France, and the Netherlands were all bourgeois revolutions, but they all had their own particular characteristics. And that's why the method of Marxism is so important. Marxism is not a study of texts and quotes, it's a study of reality. So whenever we are approaching a new phenomenon or an event, we need a cold, hard look at the facts. Now, that doesn't mean we're empiricists, because we do make use of theory in order to help us understand. Uh, I'll give an example to demonstrate this. Because much like uh, every bourgeois revolution has its own particular characteristics, the same can be said of socialist revolutions. Lenin said, if you wish to see a pure revolution, you will never live to see one. So we study past revolutions not to gain a, a blueprint for exactly how one will take place in the future, but to gain general lessons which can then be applied in the future. Uh, and there are many instances where this uh, kind of method has been forgotten. And an example of this uh, is the we can look at uh, the period of the post-war upswing. Now, revolutions don't happen just because we want them to. They happen because of the objective situation. And so that means that revolutions can happen without the existence of a mass revolutionary party. And this has happened and it's led to all sorts of weird situations. So in the post-war period, the advanced capitalist countries were seeing booming economies, but this wasn't the case in the less advanced countries. Capitalism could offer no way forward for these countries. And on the other hand, you had the example of the USSR. Even in its deformed state, it was a shining example of two very important things. First of all, how you could rapidly develop your economy. Secondly, you could do this whilst maintaining the privileges of an elite. And so this actually, uh, in the end, resulted in many elites in these countries, uh, intellectuals, generals, and people like this, Many of these became attracted to Marxism in its Stalinist form. And so in one country after another, you had these elites actually abolish capitalism in Syria, Ethiopia, Burma, Afghanistan. And this really confused many people who purported to be Marxists and led them to abandon the Marxist method. Some people said that these regimes were entirely healthy. And uh, so this showed the way forward. Others took a moralistic approach. Uh, and this essentially consi consisted of um, thinking, well, bad things are taking place in these uh, countries, and so they can't possibly be considered workers' states. And so ultimately, it was left to Ted Grant, who was one of the founders of this uh, organization of the International Marxist Tendency, uh, and he described these states as deformed workers' states. So he used the Marxist uh, the theory of Bonapartism. He, he characterized them as worker states because of the form of property they were based on. However, 
they were Bonapartist because the working class were not in uh, political power from the beginning. It's similar to Pinochet's Chile. Pinochet's Chile was a capitalist state because of the form of property it was based on. Uh, and that's despite the fact that many capitalists, the ruling class, were oppressed. Of course, they were far less oppressed than the working class. But if you take a moralistic position and purely judge the class nature of a state on the basis of whether bad stuff is done, you really would be unable to explain why Chile was capitalist whilst part of the ruling class was oppressed. Now, to finish up, the, the, the early humans were almost completely at the mercy of nature. As humanity has developed, we've attained more and more control over our existence. That doesn't mean that we're able to ignore laws of nature. What it means instead is that we're better able to study and understand these laws and so make them work for us. We can take this example of agriculture. Um, with the development of science and technology, we've been able to produce a huge amount more food than in the past. So humanity today is far less held hostage by nature. To a far lesser degree, the naturally caused famines threaten the survival of humanity. And so in a certain sense, this has made humanity more free. For Marxists, freedom doesn't mean freedom from laws. It means understanding them and so making them work for us. And yet, despite us producing enough food to feed 10 billion people, a child dies from starvation every 10 seconds. And this is because whilst we have increased our control of natural laws to a far higher degree than in the past, we live in an anarchic social system, the capitalist system. And so that's why we fight for a democratically planned economy. But this wouldn't be the, the end of history. It would be the start of our real history as a species. The early humans, they would uh, hear thunder coming from the sky and they'd have no conception as to what was causing it. They would put it down to gods that can't be controlled. And today, many people uh, throw their hands up in despair because of the poverty and hunger that we see amongst plenty that this anarchic system brings about. Well, well a democratically planned economy could effectively distribute work and resources. No longer would we, we be completely subject to these laws that we don't understand and can't control we would instead be able to make them work for us. And so this would be, as, uh, as Engels described it, the leap from necessity to that of freedom. And it is that that we are fighting for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jack. I think that was an excellent introduction to the discussion. And we will now move right into the discussion. The first speaker will be Joel Bergman from Canada. Uh, hello. Well, the most, uh, I think, dangerous books written against Marxism are not not the openly right-wing ones, actually. Uh, one of the latest such books uh, published is called The Dawn of Everything. Uh, this is written by uh, David Wengro and David Graeber. Now, David Graeber uh, is famous for the role that he played uh, in the Occupy Wall Street movement, uh, and he's a well-known anarchist anthropologist. So many people have been excited for this book, which promises a new science of history. Uh, the central thesis of the dawn of everything is that humans can choose their social structure basically regardless of material conditions. Uh, they therefore draw the conclusion that the only laws governing historical development are those we make up ourselves. This is basically a, an idealist history. Um, while they, they're doing this to try to say that we can change society, uh, they end up in reactionary conclusions. Uh, so the book uh, argues, starts arguing against uh, egalitarian hunter-gatherer origins. Uh, the only problem is that the existence of our communistic past is very well established through uh, hunter-gatherer studies. Uh, so basically what they do is they ignore 95% of human history, uh, and instead they attack the word egalitarian or equality. Because And they say that there's no common conception of what this word means, therefore, uh, you know, there must not be an egalitarian past. But this is a common idealist trick, they changing a word to try to change the material reality. When they actually start commenting on hunter-gatherer societies, um, the best argument they come up with is that some of them varied depending on the season, 
which is true, but that doesn't get much beyond material conditions, which is this, the weather seasons. Uh, one of the biggest uh, attacks on historical materialism in this book uh, is that they argue that the Neolithic Revolution is a myth that never happened. Uh, this was, uh, as Jack described, a transition from hunting and gathering to sedentary, sedentary societies based on farming. Uh, as Jack described, this was a transition from hunting and gathering to sedentary societies based on farming. Uh, and this period marked a huge development in the productive forces and, uh, and a fairly abrupt transformation with the emergence of cities. And this was the basis for the development of class society and the state. Uh, one of the main thrusts of the dawn of everything is that we should abandon the idea that society was egalitarian and then overthrown by class society because this resembles a Garden of Eden type argument. Um, but their main question that they ask in the book is how we got stuck in an exploitative hierarchical society. But if we took it, they, they provide a map in the book that shows where agriculture developed independently. Um, all of these areas developed into highly stratified class societies with states. As well, none, none of the first major world empires appeared anywhere else. So <laughs> it's almost as if material conditions, similar material conditions produce similar results, which just proves the theory of the Neolithic Revolution. Um, as, as idealists, the authors try to fit reality into their pre preconceived ideas. For example, they try to prove that things like private property and the state have always existed. Uh, they say, quote, if private property has an origin, it is as old as the idea of the sacred, which is likely as old as humanity itself. They say that private ownership is almost identi identical with the concept that something is owned by a sacred being. In other words, uh, private property existed uh, as an idea first, uh, but this argument makes very little sense. Uh, the common idea amongst hunter-gatherers that a sacred being owns the forest, the lakes, or the rivers, or the mountains means precisely the opposite of private ownership. It means, it means that these things cannot be owned by anyone because they're communists. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a chapter in this book called Why the State Has No Origins. Uh, here they basically say that because there's no agreed upon definition of the state, Therefore, searching for the origins of the state is little more than chasing a, fan, a phantasm. Uh, in an earlier book that Graeber, David Graeber, uh, wrote, he says, quote, Most hunter-gatherers we know have plenty of kings, but they studiously avoid allowing sovereign powers to fall into the hands of mortal humans. So again, basically they're saying hunter-gatherers had the idea of a king, and therefore they had kings. Uh, but people can have ideas all they want. What is important is which is why ideas of class society and the state take form in the material reality. Uh, the authors try to redefine communism, uh, describing it basically as people helping each other or mutual aid. Uh, they say communism, quote, communism is not some magical utopia and neither does it have anything to do with the ownership of the means of production. It is something that exists right now, that exists to some degree in any human society, although there has never been one in which everything has been organized in that way, and it would be difficult to imagine how there could be. Uh, in another book that Graeber wrote, he, he, he actually is an active opponent of revolution, uh, and I think this is a thrust of this book as well. He says, quote, Since the days of the French Revolution, it has inspired millions, but it has also done enormous damage to humanity. It is high time, I think, to brush the entire argument aside. So no revolution, uh, just mutual aid, people helping each other, and uh, trying to build enclaves of communism within capitalism. Uh, but this is just a defense of the status quo uh, couched in pseudo-radical language. Um, in this book, they, they quote a indigenous uh, North American leader called Candy Aronk, um, who says that, who, who is criticizing the French for having separate material interests, money, uh, classes. Uh, he specifically states that such things did not, does, do not exist in his society. Um, that's just because he, 
This is because Candia Ronk was living in a communist society, and so he was critical of capitalism and feudalism. But then the authors of The Dawn of Everything, basically they say, quote, recall how the indigenous critique of Candia Ronk was more interested in liberty and mutual aid than property. But this isn't what Candia Ronk says at all. And this is a very dishonest method. Yeah, so just to finish off here, in this book, which is 700 pages, the authors actually never answer the questions that they pose. How did we get stuck? Uh, I, guess, I guess some people just got stupid and lost their freedom for some reason. So starting with the bold claim about the dawn of everything, you're left with nothing. Uh, and I believe this is just down to the idealist methods of the authors, which, which don't help to clarify anything. And what they recommend is that we need to rediscover the freedoms that make us human in the first place. So in order to be free, we need to learn how to be free, which is a complete tautology. So I think we should not be surprised that we're seeing books like this that are a, a, a attack on Marxism. Um, capitalism is in deep crisis. Revolution is on the order of the day. Uh, and the masses are revolting against the rising inequality. Uh, so it's not surprising you see books uh, oppose revolution. They're opposing overthrowing capitalism. Uh, and I hope that I, I hope that I help people to see through this. Uh, and I invite everyone here to reject these ideas uh, and to fight for socialist revolution. Thank you. Well, the next speaker will be Alessio Marconi the, from Italy. Thank you, Alan. Well, I originally wanted to speak about the role of the individual and the individual freedom. But Jack explained it very well in his uh, lead off. And so I, I think it's clear enough how all these uh, attacks against uh, Marxism made in, in the name of uh, the complete freedom of the individual uh, denying natural and social laws ultimately are uh, an idealistic uh, view and provide uh, no, no concrete alternative. So they end uh, justifying the position of the ruling class uh, or your position in society well in fact uh, historical materialism is uh, well, g gives I, us a, a view and a concrete way to change reality by knowing it anyway to identify historical laws which are an abstraction and a generalization made from the concrete process does not mean that everything in history uh, should follow mechanically a script written in advance. It is a complex reality in which each element dialectically interacts with all the others and has an influence on their development. For example, not all the countries follow the same stage of historical development. We can see it, uh, that very clearly in the development of uh, relations of uh, imperialistic domination, where the development of some countries not only allow but implies the backwardness of others. And these relationships themselves can change over time. As Lenin explained, and, and that is something we are seeing precisely in the current epoch. Similarly, we can see elements of different modes of production combined something that is explained by the law of uh, uneven and combined development. Think of the rediscovery of slavery in the modern era to develop. Uh, just think of the rediscovery of slavery in the modern era to develop uh, the basis of American capitalism. But this can also mean that certain classes must fulfill the historical tasks of others. The theory of permanent revolution explains that in a backward country, the weak uh, bourgeoisie that is uh, 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 dependent on the imperialism is unable to fulfill the tasks of the bourgeois revolution. It is the workers who must do it. But in doing so, they must seize power and already set themselves the tasks of the socialist revolution. A theory that was brilliantly proven by October Revolution in Russia. So this dialectical view is the complete opposite of the uh, arid, ossified distortion that the Mensheviks and later the Stalinists gave to historical materialism, which in fact led to an uncountable defeats, as it would have done in Russia without the intervention of uh, Lenin, as Jack explained. So historical materialism is a powerful theor theoretical uh, instrument that must be used in order to make, to use Lenin's expression, a concrete analysis of the concrete situation, to be able to act on it consciously. And so we see that uh, 
In fact, the existence of a subjective conscious factor to play this role is necessary. Also, the transition from the capitalist mode of production to socialism is um, some way different from the, the previous one. For example, we, we can have a protracted period of development of elements of socialist economy in the framework of a capitalist society. Capitalism develops, for example, the internal planning of big businesses and the world division of labor for its pursuit of profit. And under the control of the bourgeoisie, this is used to intensify the exploitation of the working class. But at the same time, they express the full potential of a planned socialist economy. But that's, that's only a potential that uh, uh, can express itself only on condition that there is a general over, overthrow of the entire system. And become it, its opposite. This is a, is a typical di dialectic overthrow. And, and that requires a conscious role of the working class i.e. for the first time in history, the conscious action of the majority of society to seize power. And this brings us again to the role of the subjective factor, i.e. the revolutionary party. The subjective part, factor is a product of historical development because it, it brings together that, that layer that best understands the needs that arise in a given his, historical epoch. And at the same time, it is an actor in history. Its numerical strength, its influence on wider sectors, political quality of its cadres, its, its ability using the general analysis, the general view given by Marxist theory to respond to the concrete problems that arise in a real struggle are decisive in leading the working class to victory and giving humanity a future. Lenin, Lenin played a decisive individual role in 1917, as Jack explained. He was able to do so because he understood the historical tasks facing the Russian working class, but this alone would not have been enough. This understanding could combine with the objective process of the masses, and turn into a material force because Lenin had built the Bolshevik party tirelessly over decades. And without this work, the revolution would not have been uh, victorious. So historical necessity is not something passively guaranteed, but something that must be realized. It must be conquer not in an academic salon, but in a real struggle between living forces. As Marx wrote uh, in, uh, in a letter, it would be very convenient to make universal history if one only accepted battle on the condition of an infallible outcome. So uh, this is a task before us. And only in this way can we achieve a new le level of freedom from mankind not an unreal, idealistic, individual freedom from the laws uh, of nature and, and society, but collective, a collective uh, freedom, which, to use Hegel's expression, consists in the understanding of necessity to, to be able to use it, these laws. And, and from a materialist point of view, this consists in the rational, democratic planned use of the productive forces according to the objective laws and for the real the, 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 and consciously uh, using them One minute. for the realization of human potential on an unprecedented level. And as Jack uh, already said, but I think uh, it must be emphasized, this, this will not be at all the end of the history. But if anything, the beginning of uh, the true history of the human race. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessio. The next speaker would be Serena Capodicasa, also from the Italian section. When Marte Dengas explained that the fundamental factor in history lays in the economic base, they always added in the last analysis. These few words are very important 
and have never been understood by all those accusing Marxism of being unilateral, one-sided, deterministic, and so on. Historical and, dialect and dialectical materialists are two inseparable aspects when one deals with the Marxist view of history. In several writings and letters, Engels stressed this point. For instance, in a letter to Borges, where, where he said, the political, legal, philosophical, religious, literary, artistic development rests upon the economic, but they all react upon one another and upon the economic base. It is not the case that the economic situation is the cause alone acted and everything else only a passive effect. Rather, there is a reciprocal interaction with a fundamental economic necessity, which in the last uh, instance always asserts itself. In another letter to Karen Schmidt, Engels explains that this reaction by the superstructure on the economic structure is made possible by the division of labor in society. Because the division of labor gives a relative independence to superstructures like the state, ideology, philosophy, and so on. For instance, the state, with its relative independence, and I underline relative independence, can either promote or hinder the economic development through its economic politics. A given ideology or philosophy prevailing among the intellectuals can either provide a vital environment for the development of science and technology and therefore of production, or it can constitute uh, an obstacle. We have to consider that this process of interaction be with, between structure and superstructure unfold not in a static way, but in a continuous motion of development, of change, Engels says that the philosophy of every epoch has, as its presupposition, certain definite intellectual material handed down to it by its predecessors. Now, at a certain point, this intellectual material inherited from the past does not correspond anymore to the changes of the economic base. For instance, in Europe during the 16th century, the Catholic counter-reform and the Saint Inquisition were the ideological and religious representative of the decaying feudalism and represented an obstacle for the further development of science and consequently of the productive forces in the, in the epoch of rising capitalism. The rising bourgeoisie needed a more open and dynamic view of the world to develop technology in order in turn to develop production. As Alan this morning said, in the religious field, this found an expression in the Lutheran reform, in the field of art, in the Renaissance. Um, and the bourgeoisie also needed a materialistic outlook in philosophy that was represented by the English empirical school of Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, then by the French materialism, and finally, in a later stage, by the Enlightenment. In this living struggle between this conflicting vision of the world, on the one hand, the Catholic, idealistic, reactionary, on the other hand, the materialistic one, what was the main factor in asserting which one would, could prevail? The fact that the bourgeoisie was the, rise, the new ruling class that was rising. Engels gave this answer. The bourgeoisie, for the development of its industrial production, required the science which asserted the physical properties of natural objects and the modes of action of the forces of nature. Now, up to then, science had been the humble handmaid of the church, had not been allowed to overlap the limits set by faith, and for that reason had been no science at all. Science rebelled against the church, the bourgeoisie could not do without science, and therefore had to join in the rebellion. But this must not be seen in a one-sided way. As the unfolding of an materialistic outlook in philosophy and of new scientific discoveries, dialectically rep represents a threat for the ruling class, as it, it can free the masses from the religious prejudice that is a tool for the bourgeois domination in society, on society. Now, we can see it today in the idealistic outlook that characterizes many scientists, um, and because this uh, side of the coin, uh, this uh, dialectical uh, role played by the uh, ideology, it's become particularly relevant in the declining stage of capitalism. And so we can have scientists with an idealistic outlook and with the idealistic theories like the Big Bang Theory and the Eisenberg Principle in, in Determination. Science as a superstructure develops following the need of economic structures, but at the same time is subjected to the political interests of the ruling class. 
And in the period of, of the final decay of capitalism, the political interest of the capitalists represents an obstacle to the further rational development of the productive forces and of humanity in, ger in general. So once again, we see the superstructure corresponding to a decaying uh, economic system that reacts back on the economic base as a break, as an obstacle to genuine progress. That doesn't mean that, that, that there cannot be no new discoveries at all, but in general, the prevailing factor is the counter-revolutionary interest of the ruling class for its survival. Now, all this has very concrete consequences for us. As we are called to engage a struggle against all the ruling ideas, the ideology, philosophy, culture, all the ideas that, that are the reflection of a decaying rotten system that can play no progressive role anymore. But this struggle of ideas is not to be won by us in the academy, in the universities, but among the vanguard of the working class and the youth in the process of building of the revolutionary party, the party that is needed to overthrow capitalism that would mean to free a new rational economic base that is built in a socialist economy based on planification and the uh, collective um, property of the means of production that in the last analysis is needed for the full unfolding of all the potential of humanity, not only uh, under all point of views, not only for the production, for the productive forces, but in everything, culture, art, knowledge, for the full unfolding of the potential of humanity in general. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Serena. That was another great contribution. Our next speaker will be Roberto Sarti. Good uh, evening or good afternoon uh, to everybody. Uh, one of the features of the actual situation of the crisis of the capitalist system is uh, the low intellectual level, the stupidity of the leaders of the ruling class. We often joke about it, uh, Alan, yesterday about the British ruling class. But uh, we all know that ideas and men does not come out of the sky. And uh, there is um, a sentence uh, of uh, German ideology of a very, very important book that I recommend everybody to read where uh, Marx and Engels explain very well the, this situation. I quote, men are the producers of their conceptions, ideas, etc. But real active men, as they are conditioned by a definite development of their productive forces and of the intercourse corresponding to this, up to its furthest forms. So in a period where a class cannot develop the productive forces anymore, as they did before, and this is the case everywhere, but especially the case of Italy, where there is a real decayed, decay of society and the economy, it is more likely that uh, inside this kind of society, the men or women who could emerge would be second-rate mediocrity persons. Not that uh, other uh, more clever people doesn't exist, but they cannot raise to that level. It's less likely. As in another uh, page of this uh, wonderful book, German Ideology, uh, Marx and Engels said, uh, circumstances made men no less than men make circumstances. This is a very dialectical concept that is important to bear in mind. And uh, we come to the, what uh, Alessio explained yesterday about Italy, where even the most clever of representative of the bourgeoisie in Italy, with Draghi, the former prime minister, remain trapped in a system of decline. So, uh, it's very unlikely, therefore, that the, in the, within the ruling class will uh, rise men of great depth. The decline of culture, the decline of ideas is also related to this, to the decline of the productive forces. There is a very scientific explanation at the end of, of what is happening uh, 
in the clashes uh, uh, of uh, the Italian ruling class. Our view of history is often stated, but it's more, always important to, to establish. It's dynamic, it's not static. The belief that we always uh, uh, hear that uh, human being will never change, can never change. Yeah, a revolution is a good thing, but no. How can you do it? Uh, the human being is uh, selfish and all this rubbish. It's not a scientific thinking. Social relations has their own logic. As long as people live in the determined relationship, they will think in a given way. But uh, relationship in society change, change every time. And that's why we discuss perspectives to discuss when and where uh, this, those breaking points come and when there will be a change in the consciousness of the masses, where these changes could happen. And we are living in an epoch like this when changes happen quickly. If we come back to the, to the sentence of uh, Marx and Engels, uh, that circumstances made men, but also men made circumstances, we can also understand better the situation of the leadership of working class in Italy and also in other parts of the world. There is a big vacuum and the leadership of the unions doesn't put forward an alternative point of view from the ruling class one. But why? One of the reasons is that class struggle for a whole period has been put in the background. Our circumstances were made men, which made men, sorry. The class struggle is that circumstance. It will be the circumstance that will provide the space where the fighters, uh, which up until now uh, have been relegated, where the militants were relegated in the second division in the outskirts of town, when the new leaders of the working class could emerge in the heat of the class struggle, is in the heat of the real processes uh, where uh, there will be the emer where we could see a new leadership of the working class. It's in the and it will be in this space that will come very soon that the, uh, our organization is this space that must fill in. And it's a fight for the one, for not only for the leadership, but first for the vanguard of the ruling class that we must wage in the future. And I'm quite sure that we will succeed after this wonderful uh, uh, discussion and uh, university. Thank you, comrades. Thank you very much, Roberto. We will now listen to our last speaker for this session, who is Josh Allward, Allward from the British Textbook. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you, Jack, for that excellent introduction. Marx and Engels famously wrote, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And I thought it would be interesting to take a brief look at how the understanding of class struggle has developed over time. I've sometimes seen it argued that ancient societies didn't recognize the class struggle and therefore Marx was wrong. But don't take Marx's word for it. Take this from Thucydides um, in his work on the Peloponnesian War, written over 2,400 years ago. I quote, about this time took place the rising of the commons at Samos against the upper classes. The Samian commons put to death some 200 in all of the upper classes and banished 400 more and themselves took their land and houses and the commons henceforth governed the city, excluding the landholders from all share in affairs. That sounds like class struggle to me. And actually, the question of democracy and oligarchy in ancient Greece was not an abstract moral one, as the liberals tend to present it. It was class war. Livy wrote about the bitter struggle of the orders in the Roman Republic. And that struggle often broke out into bloodshed and even civil war. And it was ultimately this struggle, or the impasse of this struggle, which led to the rise of the Caesars. Before Marx, bourgeois historians trace the class struggle beneath the various political parties and religious sects of the English and French revolutions. Izo, who was not a, revolution, uh, a revolutionary in any way, he wrote, in order to understand political institutions, we must study the various strata existing in society and their mutual relationships. In order to understand these various social strata, we must know the nature and the relations of landed property. There are two important differences with this view of the class struggle and that of Marx. 
First is the question, what is the division of society into different classes based on? The ancients saw it more as the inevitable product of human nature. You always had strong and weak, and so you always had rich or poor. Bourgeois historians try to find the different forms of property in the different constitutions of society. But this actually led back to idealism because they couldn't explain where those constitutions came from. So having explained that political ideas are determined by class, they then explained that class was determined by the ideas that people have about the constitution. And so they went on in circles effectively. And the second question is what impact does the class struggle have on social development? And again, the, the ancients didn't think, didn't really see the class struggle having any impact on social development because they didn't believe in social development at all. They had a cyclical view of history. The commons and the democracy would win, the rich and the oligarchy would win, and so on again and again um, for all time. So the class struggle was more an unavoidable evil that we just had to live through. Bourgeois historians prior to Marx saw the class struggle as a source of progress when it was a struggle of the bourgeoisie against the so-called idle classes of the nobility and the church. But they treated the struggle between the workers and the capitalists as an avoidable evil to be suppressed in order to ensure development, which is essentially the liberal view of class and class struggle today. This is a classic example of how the bourgeoisie was forced to abandon a scientific outlook the moment it was challenged by the rising working class. What Marx did is he gave the class struggle an objective foundation for the first time. And that foundation is the development of the productive forces. In a letter um, in 1852, Marx wrote, I do not claim to have discovered either the existence of classes in modern society or the struggle between them. My own contribution was one, to show that the existence of classes is merely bound up with certain historical phases in the development of production. Two, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat. And three, that this dictatorship itself constitutes no more than a transition to the abolition of all classes into a classless society. Now, some comrades might be shocked to learn that the overwhelming majority of academic Marxists actually reject the development of the productive forces as the determining factor in human history. They reject what Marx considered to be basically his only original contribution. They reduce it to technological determinism and claim it was a hangover of liberal materialism in Marx's analysis. How they remain Marxists, I, I don't know. And ironically, the alternative they put forward of the class struggle as the determining factor in human history is arguably closer to the bourgeois conception that I explained earlier. Their mistake, well, among many, lies in isolating the development of the productive forces from the social beings who carry it out. They fail to understand the dialectical relationship that exists between the productive forces and social relations. The different forms and distribution of property, the concentration of the means of production, flow from the development and needs of production itself, such as the social division of labour. The very existence of the working class and its growing weight in the economy is clearly linked to the development of industry under capitalism, which is something that Marx observed in his lifetime. And capitalist production is more international and more planned than it ever was before, which has an important influence on the class struggle. Note that Marx wrote that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat, not possibly. And the reason for this is nothing other than the development of production under capitalism. But the class struggle also reacts back on production. Critics of Marx point to the fact that technological progress under capitalism, such as the development of artificial intelligence, um, has not resulted in the creation of a socialist paradise for humanity. But this proves Marx's point. The development of new technologies and so on do not automatically and directly transform social relations. Actually, today is a clear example of the acute conflict between the development of the productive forces and the limits of capitalist relations. What Marx predicted is that these relations, these fetters, would inevitably be burst asunder by nothing other than the class struggle and revolution. This is why Marx wrote in The Pod Poverty of Philosophy, of all the instruments of production, the greatest productive power is the revolutionary class itself. Today, the further development of the productive forces, and with it, the future of the human race, depends on the victory of the working class. Let us go forward to that victory. Thank you very much, Josh. That was a very good way to end this discussion. If you like the discussion and want to learn more about Marxism, I would recommend you to get a copy of What is Marxism? Particularly, this book is a very good start for newcomers to Marxism.
you can get your copy at wellread-books.com where you can also find a variety of books on history and Marxist theory. So now I will pass it over to Jack for the sum up. Thank you very much, Helen, and thank you all comrades for uh, an excellent discussion. And I think a running theme really through this discussion was actually the importance of ideas. And this might seem strange in a session where we've emphasized the importance of a materialist understanding of history. But ideas are extremely important. On the one hand, they can hold back the class struggle. It's for this reason that the ruling class promotes racism, sexism, homophobia, and all forms of hatred. It's a way of dividing the working class and cutting across the class struggle. Now, of course, it can't hold back the class struggle forever, but it is an example of the role that ideas can play. Uh, ideas can also play a progressive role. I mean, if we, if we denied this, then uh, you'd wonder what we're doing here for four days. Ideas can act as an incredible guide to action for revolutionaries. But on top of this, as, as Mark said, uh, ideas can become a material force when they grip the minds of the masses. So the example of the ideas of Lenin and Trotsky is a very good one. Their ideas chimed with the outlook of the mass of the working class and peasantry in Russia at that specific time. And actually, I think we're beginning to see the, the beginnings of a similar situation today. 30 years ago, uh, Marxists were huddling together for warmth in, uh, in dark corners. For the mass of the working class, uh, the ideas of Marxism didn't seem to correspond with reality. It seemed as though it was the, the end of history, as uh, Francis Fukuyama put it. But now capitalism really is reaching its limits. And that means that our ideas are becoming more and more true for larger numbers of people. Uh, and this in itself really is only due or only possible due, the, due to the social crisis, which in itself is determined by the economic base. Now, if you compare this approach to that that Josh laid out, where you separate out the class struggle from the development of the productive forces, it would imply that you can have a revolution whenever and wherever, but that would be incredibly disarming because it would mean that we have no objective way of understanding history or society. And it's really, we have to underline this point, that it's when there's a clash between the relations of production and the further development of the bone of production, that's when society goes into crisis and you see a period of revolution and counter-revolution. Now, Joel, I think, made a very important point when he said that uh, the most dangerous books, if you like, are those that um, are written by those who purport to be left. Uh, and this David Graeber is certainly uh, painted as having been uh, a radical. But not only that, he's painted as being more intelligent and uh, more nuanced uh, than, uh, than us crusty, uh, outdated Marxists. But you can really see, uh, despite the fact that uh, the, this uh, nonsense is packaged up as being new ideas, you can see that there are really no new ideas under the sun. Because the idea that we can just decide what sort of society to live in out of our own free will is actually far older than Marxism. It's that of the utopian socialists. But really to say that is a big insult to the utopian socialists. Because what you can say about these people is that at least they were actually fighting for a higher and better form of society and not just justifying the status quo from a pseudo radical uh, position like David Graeber. I'd say that David Graeber's book proves Engels' statement that the struggle on the ideological front is just as important as that of the struggle on the political and economic fronts. Uh, and we are engaged in a battle, in a struggle of ideas. Uh, and it's not just us saying that. Uh, our enemies are very much concerned with this as well. Uh, a few years ago, a CIA report from the 1980s was uh, declassified. It first of all talks about criticism of Marxism from a right-wing point of view. But then it goes on to say, even more effective in undermining Marxism were those intellectuals who set out as true believers to apply Marxist theory but ended by rethinking and rejecting the entire tradition. It also specifically uh, praises theorists who, uh, and this is a quote, reject the hitherto dominant Marxist theories of historical progress. Uh, and Joel actually told me before the meeting started that he couldn't believe that stuff like this uh, is published because it's nonsense. I think Joel very much demonstrated how it is nonsense. But I'd say that that's actually why it's published, because the ruling class can offer no genuine way forward. And so instead, it has to uh, promote the idea that there's no such thing as progress. 
it promotes theorists that uh, reject the, the existence of an objective world. And it promotes theorists, of course, who, uh, you know, reject revolution as being a very bad idea. Now, uh, Alessio said that um, the theory of the permanent revolution was proved correct by the experience of the Russian Revolution. Uh, and in academia, uh, I think uh, maybe comrades know, you are, you are encouraged really to think of theories sort of like they're different outfits. You maybe try on Marxism today, you try realism on tomorrow, you try whatever else the day after that. They're all just different, equally valid ways of looking at the world. Oh, well, that's not quite right, because of course, Marxism is less valid than all the others. Now, clearly, this is, this is wrong. A theory, really, is a hypothesis about reality. You make a prediction uh, given certain circumstances, uh, and it's proved correct or wrong by reality. Roberto went a, a little bit more deeply into the role of the individual. Uh, we can ask ourselves, uh, you know, why do certain leaders rise to the top? Uh, and really, it's because they reflect better than others, social forces. So over the recent period in Britain, you've had uh, Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn as being two different leaders that have risen to the top. Uh, and really, Boris Johnson is, uh, is an excellent reflection of the decrepit nature of the, of the ruling class, especially the British ruling class, uh, which is why, as, uh, as Rob said yesterday, all of his potential replacements look uh, just as mad, if not more than him. And this is a reflection of, you know, in the past, uh, Trotsky once said that the British ruling class used to uh, plan in terms of uh, centuries and continents. Um, so, but today, they barely know what's going to happen next week. So this uh, ruling class that was uh, focused on long-term planning has developed into one focused on speculation and gambling. Uh, and a chancer like Boris Johnson reflects this very well. Now, similarly, with uh, Jeremy Corbyn, um, his, his slogan was for a kinder, gentler politics. He was presented as this dangerous radical, um, but he was a mild reformist, really. But he was able to rise to the top because he acted as a lightning rod for a social movement. Uh, first of all, because after years of austerity, cuts and uh, pressure on living standards, there was a crying demand uh, for, for radical change, for you know different way of doing things. But uh, at the same time as this, the working class in Britain was kind of waking up after years and years of, of sleep. And so Jeremy Corbyn really reflected the kind of naive character of the advanced layers of the working class at that time. What this shows is that without the presence of a mass revolutionary party that has been steeled in the ideas of, of, of Marxism, the working class has to learn and relearn uh, lessons. The Revolutionary Party can be described as the historical memory of the working class. Uh, and so if it exists in a, in a mass force, it can act as a catalyst and it can accelerate the development of consciousness. Now, I want to conclude by going back to this example of the Roman Empire, because here you had society going into crisis. Because there was no uh, active social force that could show the way forward, there was a, a, a complete collapse, basically, of, civil, of the civilization. Uh, and human progress was uh, thrown back for an extremely long period of time. And we face a similar, but actually far more pressing problem today. Now, maybe comrades uh, know, but this week it was uh, 40 degrees in London. Uh, I think London was the hottest place in the entire world for those two days. The reason for this, right, as uh, comrades know, is the climate crisis. Uh, and capitalism is completely unable to solve this crisis. You don't have to take my word for it. I've got uh, a quote from The Economist. This is not a Bolshevik journal. In any case, they say, though renewable energy could profitably generate a fair share of the world's electricity, nobody knows how to get rich simply by removing greenhouse gases. We have the technology in existence to be able to solve climate change. But it's not done because it's not profitable to do it. And so what we have before us today, um, I'd say, is, is it's what Rosa Luxemburg said all of those years ago. We're faced with a choice between socialism or barbarism. And so I think everyone uh, who's watching this uh, today should, should think about this. If you care about the continuation of the human race, which I, I hope you do, you have a duty to join the fight against capitalism. But that's not as, it, as an individual, you know, as an individual, really, we are powerless. Uh, I know we were, we were discussing Lenin earlier, but Lenin was able to make a difference, not just because of his ideas and the time he was living in, but because he had a mass party that was able to transmit uh, these ideas to the mass of the working class. Now, 
in some senses, we have an advantage today. You know, Josh uh, pointed out that the class struggle doesn't take place uh, separate from the development of the mode of production. And the development of large scale production and, and globalization, if you want to call it that, have, have been incredibly positive for us. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday, yeah, yesterday about the growing wave of, uh, of trade union uh, membership in the United States. Well, companies like Apple, Starbucks, Amazon, are all international companies. And so it's much easier today for, to have uh, contagion, if you like, across the world. But in other senses, we are, we are way behind, really. Today, uh, the Marxists are a small but growing uh, minority. Uh, and we're in a race against time, really. Uh, and we are falling behind. So, and I will finish on this. Uh, I think that all of you who are watching uh, today, and if you are not a member of the IMT, join us. Uh, and together we can build an organization that's capable of leading the working class to the overthrow of this decrepit system across the world.